I want to share this story because someone might find it useful. But I shared this information urging you to be extremely careful and begging you never to use it unless you find that you must. During my freshman year of college, I lost control, mostly due to freedom from my parents and a group of friends who were more interested in in a good party than a good grade. I spent more time sleeping and drinking than I did in class or studying, but all that changed and I woke up in the hospital, bruised and covered in cuts. I was told that I'd been in a car accident the night before. I and two others were driving home from a party when the car crossed into the center divider, rolling several times and tossing all of us from the car. Miraculously, I escaped the crash with some scrapes and bruises, but mostly unharmed. The other guy in the car, Michael, broke his arm, got a bad concussion. However, the third occupant, a girl named Sam, was tossed from the rolling car and crushed underneath it. Took a rescue crew four hours to extricate her from underneath the crumpled mess of metal. By the time they got to her, she was beyond saving. Police had no idea who was driving during the crash, and I couldn't remember anything about that night due to my state of impairment. Michael and I got stiff warnings about driving while intoxicated or, or getting into a car with a drunk person. But other than that, we got off scot-free. My friends all said that Sam had been driving. That I was so fucked up I couldn't even walk, let alone drive a car. Despite their reassurances, I was haunted by guilt and uncertainty. Had I been driving when we wrecked? Why did I survive? Was I responsible for her death? Every night I had nightmares of Sam calling from me, from underneath her twisted metallic grave. I stopped leaving my dorm, stopped answering my phone, consumed by guilt and uncertainty. After a month of moping around my dorm, a friend of mine named Mark reached out. We talked for hours about my uncertainty and how I would never get answers. In response, he told me about the legend of the Skinwalker House. A ramshackle green shack, right off Highway 380. And here a person could meet with the ancient beings and make deals and bargains, including asking questions that otherwise could not be answered. At first, I was incredulous. I mean, I thought Mark was fucking with me, trying to play a sick prank. But I was desperate to know. So I talked with some friends who had grown up in a nearby reservation. One of them put me in touch with a tribal elder named Richard. And after a few emails and lying about doing a research project, Richard told me about summoning a skinwalker. When we first spoke, Richard was hesitant to talk about the subject. But after repeated calls and face-to-face -face meetings, Richard explained the ritual to summon the skinwalker. And as we finished our conversation, Richard warned me that when, when one makes a bargain with a witch, the witch always takes something in return. I'll give you the same warning that Richard gave me. The skinwalker is not to be summoned or questioned on a whim. So please... Do not summon a skinwalker, unless you're ready to accept the consequences of your actions. If you decide to disregard my warning, you'll need the pelt of a coyote, four animal fat candles, a rosary that has been blessed by a priest, a leader of animal blood, and a crow's feather. Skinwalkers are most active right after sundown, when there's a storm coming in from the southeast. The house where you can meet them is between mile marker 13 and 14. It's not hard to find. It took three months to find everything and for the perfect weather system to arrive. Mark and I drove together to the house around five, just as the sun began to sink beneath the Magdalena. Shadows oozed from the dilapidated house, its putrid green paint peeling off the bleached bone of wood. The house had no windows or doors remaining, and I could smell the mildew and rot from the road. Mark and I climbed through the barbed wire fence in front of the house and made our way in as the storm clouds rolled in, bringing with them peals of angry thunder. As we stepped inside, the smell of old, rotting wood overwhelmed me. I fought the urge to vomit as we sat down on a stripped wooden floor. We spread out the coyote pelt with the head facing me placing the greasy wax candles at the end of its paws. We then placed the crow's feather in the mouth of the coyote pelt. After setting up the pelt and lighting the candles, Mark left the house and 
parked the car at a turnoff a mile up the road. When I was sure he was gone, I took the rosary out of my hands. Pulled hard, scattering the beads across the floor and pelt. I sat down at the head and took the goat's blood that I had procured from a butcher, and I dumped it across the pelt, spattering myself on the ground in the dark maroon spatters. The storm continued its steady progression across the desert, and the roar of thunder rumbled in my chest. I closed my eyes and focused on the sound of the storm, willing the creature towards me. I was lost deep in my focus when I heard it. A wolf's howl mixed with the scream of a woman. A horrible cacophony of animal and man swirling together. I opened my eyes to see the house wreathed in fog. Supernatural mist surrounding the house, but not permeating the structure itself. I heard a deep guttural chant coming from beneath me as the creature approached the dilapidated wooden structure. And then came the footsteps. Heavy, padding steps, crunching against the gravel beneath me, quickly followed by the creak of wood as it stepped into the house. Its hot breath stung at the back of my neck as it sniffed me before circling in front of me. It had taken the form of a heavy gray wolf, far greater than even myself. The legs were too long and spindly, the hide patchy and balding, and its ears were short and tattered. The skinwalker sat across the pelt from me, staring at me like I was a rabbit about to be devoured. Its eyes were unlike those of a wolf's, with dark brown iris, angry white sclera, and round pupils. Suddenly the wolf let out a pained yelp and began to shudder. The braying whimpers of the animal filled the house as the fur and skin began to slow off the creature. The flesh sizzled and popped like frying meat as the body began to disintegrate quickly followed by the opening of the cavity chest as a woman crawled out of the quickly decomposing wolf carcass. She had Native American features with skin so wrinkled and scarred I couldn't even guess her age. Hair hung in black, stringy strands, and worst of all, her lips were stretched and mangled so that her mouth could never close. She wore a patchwork of skins and pelts and a pair of antlers atop her head. Even sitting, she was nearly a head taller than me. She locked eyes with me, inhuman, horizontal slits like a goat's, peering out from beneath the mess of hair that hung around her face. Her voice croaked in her throat, and a harsh, guttural dialect spewed forth from her lips. My heart sank. How could I have been so stupid? Why would an ancient Navajo witch speak English? She must have noticed my disappointment because she reached for a pouch on her belt and took out some sort of gray, waxy substance. She spread it on the tips of her index finger, leaned forward and jammed her fingers into my ears, her long, dirty fingernails scratching my ear canal. I yelled in pain and surprise, and she shifted her weight back into a sitting position. For a split second, my hearing faded before the sound of the storm surged back to life with a loud crack. The old woman locked her eyes with me again, her face lit by the flickering candlelight. She spoke again, this time in English. I have given you the gift of hearing. What is it you seek from I who goes on all fours? Her voice, low and raspy, like sandpaper on stone. My voice caught in my throat, my gut tightening at her words, and I began to drift into a daze. I pulled my fingers into the flesh of my palm until I could focus again, and when I did answer, my voice was weak and uncertain. I, I need to know if I killed her. She cackled, her voice spiraling into a crescendo until she sounded like a coyote baying at frightened rabbits. Very well. I can help you. And what have you brought for me? My stomach twisted. Painfully again as fear crawled at the back of my mind. I, I, I haven't brought anything to give you. Very well. You have nothing to give. Then I must take. Do you agree to these terms? I paused for a moment. Considering what Richard had told me. But my guilt overwhelmed my rationale, and I shakily nodded my head in agreement to her terms, 
The skinwalker smiled at this, revealing rows of miscellaneous teeth in her cavernous, distorted mouth. The teeth were inhuman, with sharp, wolf-like canines mixed in with broad, flat teeth like a horse. In a horrible conglomeration of stained rows of ivory shards, the laughter came again from her lips, horrible coyote cackling that made my skin crawl. After another round of laughter, she produced a crude stone knife from her belt with a quick motion, ran it across the palm of her hand, spilling dark rivets of blood onto the pelt before reaching towards me. I extended my hand and she dug the cruel stone into the soft flesh of my palm. My skin cried out in agony and blood swept from the exposed flesh underneath. She clasped my bleeding hand with inhuman strength and pressed my wound against her own. Our blood mixed and I felt a trickle down my arm and pool at the crook of my elbow. The woman began to chant and stared into my eyes as blood continued to flow freely down our arms onto the pelt beneath us. Her voice grew rough and animalistic as she continued her chanting. As suddenly as she had started, she stopped and let go of my now-throbbing hand. How foolish you have been. Just like your forefathers. With their drink and their endless cruelty. But her blood is on her own hands. Her foolish pride gave way to steel and glass. I have given you your answer, and now, now I will take two things from you. I take from you your dreams. A wave of relief washed over me. I, I, could, I could live without dreams anymore. My dreams had been plagued with visions of Sam calling out for help beneath her metallic tomb begging for my help. With inhuman strength and speed, the skinwalker grabbed my hand again and brought it to its mouth. I pulled hard against its grip and yelled to no avail as it pushed my thumb into its mouth. Hard teeth clamped down hard against the appendage, tearing away the flesh and bone of my thumb. Blood sprayed from my wound, painting a single picture on its face. The creature chewed and I could hear the crack of bone and the squelch of soft flesh in its teeth. I screamed in agony. I clutched my hand and pressed the wound to my chest. My vision faded and blurred as I slumped to the floor. I wish I had gone unconscious. I wish I had closed my eyes. Instead, instead I watched as the skinwalker tore the flesh off its face, its long claw-like fingers shredding through skin and muscle. The skinwalker grabbed the skin on its arm and pulled, tearing it away from, from the muscle underneath, the flesh coming away like wet newspaper. I watched the muscle of its arm bulge and flex as it tore away the soft skin of its stomach, disemboweling itself, a gray coil of intestines lolled out of the abdomen. Dragging against the rough wooden floor, it continued, tearing away its flesh until only scraps remained on the skeletal frame, and I watched. I willed my eyes to close, but they would not. I stared transfixed on the horrifying visage in front of me. The figure dropped to all fours and pulled one of its pelts that it was wearing over its face. The pelt stretched and contorted, spreading over the skeletal limbs. The figure trembled and shook, twitching unnaturally. Then it began to grow, the limbs stretching and contorting, the chest becoming narrower. I watched as two sets of large antlers splintered out of the top of its head, stopping just before the ceiling. The figure continued to shift and contort until finally a massive bull elk stood in front of me. It strode out of the house, then paused and looked down at me. We locked eyes for just a moment before it let out a large bulge and then took off into the night. I pulled off my shirt and wrapped it tightly around my still bleeding hand. I staggered out of the house and glanced around, afraid the creature was waiting for me outside. There was nothing. Nothing except for the rumble of thunder and the throbbing in my hand. I walked a mile to where Mark had parked the car, all the time pleading with my body to not bleed out. Mark paled when he saw me and rushed me to the hospital. I told the staff of the hospital I had been messing with old farm equipment. A story that, that bought easily enough. In spite of everything that happened, I felt relieved with the knowledge that I still hadn't killed Sam. The skinwalker kept its word. It did take my dreams, because now I dream not about Sam, but instead about the skinwalker. A dream of the skinwalker changing and shifting. I watch time and time again as it tears apart animals for its dinner. 
The worst is when it attacks people as I'm forced to watch, as it stalks hikers and campers. I watch as it disembowels them, mounts their bodies onto tree limbs or skins them alive. I don't go into the woods anymore, for fear that I might see that thing again. But now and then, as I drift off to sleep, I hear the sound of an elk bugle, followed by peals of coyote cackling. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to give you a big thank you for watching tonight's video! And I only say video if you guys are watching on YouTube, because otherwise, thank you for subscribing to the podcast that you can get on Spotify, or on Apple's podcasting, or on Google podcasting, or wherever you guys get podcasts. Something I wanted to tell you about tonight before we end tonight's video is the Etsy shop that my wife runs. She runs a mixed tea shop with many different blends, including creepy pasta blends, and it's etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And now, for patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, which you can always find in the link in the description, I want to give you all a very big thanks. There's many of you down there in the descriptions um, who I give big thanks to, and everybody also at this tier, like Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chompinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Asia, G Weevil 3, Diana Kraus, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Nico Kao, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Last Blade Song, Don Mulemeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Steampunk Sinner, Optimistic Avocado, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Polson, Finley, and Sky Harbor. You guys are the MVPs and you guys keep the channel running and I honestly cannot thank you enough for all that you do. That's all for tonight, guys. Sweet dreams. <laughs>